Howdy, this is MC Schrafel, and today we're talking about why breathe. I'm going to look at that in three ways that I hope are of interest and novel for you. Um, and the main reason we might say, the sort of meta reason that we breathe, is of course survival. If anybody's tried to hold their breath for a long period of time, you know what it feels like when your air runs out, or uh, any situation where there is a shortness of quality air. We feel it. We need air to survive, we need to breathe to survive. But once you get under the hood of that, the body does some pretty magnificent things with our breathing. And these are the three ways that I'm talking about here, is that breathing itself helps us focus and build patterns that we use for that survival or thriving in environments. It also assists with being in a state that enables the brain to problem solve and come up with new ideas, and it also enables regeneration and action. We can think of that as, as movement of just about everything within the body and the body moving itself. So how does that happen? Well, we can look at this in terms of first stages, a little bit of, of the anatomy here is that inside the um, nasal cavity, this is what we see in the first image, is that we have these uh, cartilagic um, formations inside the nasal cavity. They're called turbinates, and they actually do vibrate and move air up the nasal passages, warming it, moistening it, getting it ready to go into the lungs. But what's been found out, as this middle picture shows, in the past oh, couple of decades only, is that the paranasal sinuses, those things you feel get really stuffy and drain into your nasal cavity and out through your nostrils when you have a cold, um, are also used to produce nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, as it's uh, inhaled then through the sinuses into the lungs, is hugely critical for what's referred to particularly as vasodilation, which lets the circulatory system uh, open up and have uh, blood and, uh, and everything in the blood move freely or more freely through the body. It lets the heart beat better. Um, it, it contributes to uh, tissue building and repair. So muscle building is a biggie when people talk about the pump and wanting to get the pump. They have a reason to do so. Well, breathe through your nose, gang. Uh, that will certainly help create that uh, without any extra outside ex or what's referred to as exogenous supplements. Now this last picture here is showing a particular component of the inside processes and that's the um, cranial nerve that is responsible for olfaction or what happens when air and scent comes into the nose. And that's this uh, tract here. I'm going to show you another view of that. This is olfactory uh, nerve or cranial nerve one, and it's pretty special. I mean, that's why it's one. I should look that up, but uh, it's cranial nerve one, and as this top, well, it's also the top of the cranial nerves. Maybe that's just why it's in, in line order, but what's special about cranial nerve one is it's the only of the other 12 uh, cranial nerves that are responsible for so much going on in the body that goes directly to the cortex as opposed to going through the thalamus which is a middle bit at the top of the brain stem-ish, in fact we'll see it over here, is that uh, the thalamus, all the other cranial nerves go through here, and that's kind of the decider, if you will, uh, for the cranial nerves about whether or not they're going to go to the rest of the cortex to a conscious area of processing and response, or stay pre-conscious, um, if you will, that's one of the aspects. But the cranial nerve here, we'll see that again, that we we're looking at before, as we get into why are we breathing and how does this awareness and pattern building thing work, is that these guys get together, so here's the two views of the cranial nerve, as air comes in, um, what is associated, here's the cool thing from the research that was uh, linked to the research is down here, um, here's a cool thing that happens, is that as we inhale, whatever we're looking at or, th or working on as we inhale is more strongly associated with uh, the amygdalic area this is, uh, of the cortex. This is the uh, periform cortex, part of the brain that says, okay, here's, here's me bringing in this information to be processed. Well, the other areas that are triggered are the amygdala itself and the hippocampus. And the amygdala is the emotional, what's referred to as the emotional 
uh, center of the, the brain or what triggers a fear or threat response that it gets processed. And the hippocampus is responsible for uh, memory, and this is what um, sleep works with to start to translate what um, the hippocampus is brought in during the day into associations that will be stored in other areas of the cortex as memory. So the big takeaway from this is simply inhale through the nose, and what starts to happen is we trigger these areas of the brain that are not only processing what to do with this sensory information, but are building patterns around that as we focus to help our focus on them to understand, perhaps, uh, why these are a threat or not a threat, that we can recognize them, respond uh, to them. And you might have had that experience where if you smell something, it brings up a memory really intensely. Well, some of the research right now is looking at, can we use this more deliberately? There's some cool uh, sleep research that Matthew Walker's crew has led looking at exactly um, that. So this is just to say oh, breathing is, is um, exciting in terms of its cognitive processes uh, and that we could leverage better for how we uh, want to build up memories, ideas, learn stuff. Now the second concept is a complement to that uh, is the problem solving and creative side that is associated with breathing when we're looking and working for an ideas and while it's often associated with a, a meditative state we can also trigger this right into a creative state. To understand that a little bit better, we can look at um, what exactly is going on with, with breathing. Because most of the time, we don't think about breathing because it's part of what's referred to as the autonomic nervous system. These are the kinds of things that happen automatically to maintain our homeostasis. We talked about homeostasis before, but homeostasis is things like um, what is our blood pH level? What's our temperature? What are the ranges in which these things can happen um, safely that we stay alive or systems like arousal or digestion these are all associated with the autonomic nervous system and there are two branches that you've heard about in the autonomic nervous system the sympathetic or fight or flight system and the parasympathetic system and the thing i really want to bring your attention to in this is that uh, sorry here we go is that um, in the parasympathetic nervous system, if you look down this image here on the right, you'll see these, these green bits and a bunch of red dots. The, this is the spine, um, the nervous system running through the spine of the central nervous system. And you'll notice that it's got bunches of nerves associated with various vertebral areas, uh, the bones in the back, that is, to trigger all these responses of fight or flight, you know, shut down your digestive system, open up the eyes, and... Um, pump in a whole bunch of hormones to get you riled up and going. If you look at the parasympathetic side, though, you'll note that one nerve uh, only up in the head is responsible for quite a bit of the same processes as we have in the parasympathetic side where you need specific nerves down the spine to stimulate them. Just want to draw your attention to that view because one of these nerves, if, as we want to shift, if you will, well, why we want to shift here. The sympathetic nervous system is not bad. It's useful for this kind of stuff over here, for sporting activities. Uh, either, you know, take down the bear before it eats the tribe, or um, that's what you get for leaving food outside of the tent, or uh, you want to calm down so that you can come up with new ideas so that you can have other food sources than just the unreliable bear. Uh, so how do we get to this parasympathetic state? How do we move from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic? Well, it's really important to get the involvement of this cranial nerve here that's triggering all these. You, you can kind of guess that. It's like, well, if this one nerve has a, a lot to do, maybe it's the most important one to trigger to move us from one state to the other. Turns out that that's the case. That's cranial nerve 10 or the vagus nerve. Now, uh, the vagus nerve does a ton of stuff, and that's why there's this diagram here of uh, this body with a couple of these lines going to these different systems that we've just seen, that if you can get the vagus nerve to turn on, it calms these guys down or brings them back online. So digestion can come back online, the heart rate slows down, um, blood starts to move from the limbs back in, into the middle parts of the body. That's pretty important for life to continue, and it also uh, helps the brain processes uh, shift different hormones 
Here we have the limbic system again. You recognize the hippocampus and the amygdala. We've seen this before and talked about the thalamus. Uh, to um, get into a calmer state, if you will, that's not a very scientific word, but you know what I mean, so that uh, we're able um, to shift gears, move away from the thing that's right in front of us to come up with some cool ideas. Now, uh, over here I've said you have to trigger the vagus nerve in order to start the shift into the parasympathetic. And it's not that the vagus nerve going on is what's sort of the most physiological important activity, but that the vagus nerve itself is a big deal in slowing down the heart. And it's that slowing down of the heart that is actually really key to letting the body know that it can let go of the stress, especially we've talked about stress at work before, uh, but uh, and shift hormones, but also to uh, let the brain uh, relax as well to think new thoughts. And one that's key to that is slower respiration and slower exhalation. We won't go into the details of this, I promise, but the shift is that we can see something called heart rate variability. And what we're looking at here is this, this is the uh, wave, if you will, of the heart where it starts its, its first pulse or in a lub-dub cycle, if you will. And these two peaks within that cycle are the measure of the heart rate pulse. And this is a, a synthesis of the waves in heart rate variability. But the goal here, and some of you may have heard about this, is that if you can um, improve the slight timing variability between these two peaks in the wave, you're a healthier person, effectively, because variability means you are more adaptive, more elastically responding to whatever's going on in your environment. And it seems that when we're stressed, our HRV or the variability between these waves, because, well, because they're also, uh, your heart's beating faster and the waves are closer together, there's less opportunity for them to vary. There's less opportunity for the heart to be as responsive to the environment as it could be in a more optimal state. So by breathing slower, and especially in slow exhalation for a bunch of physical reasons we can talk about at some other time, um, what you'll often see, especially in a healthy person, is that their heart rate will slow down and also the variability between those peaks will improve. In fact, this is used as a measure, not constantly, but in the morning for athletes to get a sense of how well they've recovered from their workout the night before. So uh, often the best HRV measures are done first thing in the morning or after, usually in the lab, it's after a 12-minute lie down so that you get a, a cleaner view of, of the state of the person in terms of their recovery. But this can also give you a snapshot about the state that you're kind of in. Um, but just with those caveats about usually the best way to do that measurement is not sitting up after being walking around, but after 12 minutes at least of real rest. That suffice it to say is that this shift from with slower respiration to slow down the heart, slowing down the breathing, has a lot of side effects on the body, from blood pressure to hormonal cues, etc. But the main thing it has on the brain is that that shift um, and HRV is used as a measurement of uh, autonomic state. The shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic means that you are in a state that is much better correlated with opportunities for creativity. And speaking of creativity, um, this is not to diss yogic practices that take forever to feel like you're getting anywhere and to short circuit that by saying all you need to do is breathe in through your nose slowly, low and light um, to achieve the same kind of uh, nirvanic experience as you do in meditation and mindfulness. Heavens to Betsy, no but it is to draw attention to the um, neuromechanical attributes that do seem to be contributing an awful lot of that effect, and only research further on will let us know uh, how much of a match that is. But we can see similar changes in the brain, apparently, especially around the hippocampus and amygdala, as longer-term um, yoga practices. So you can have your yoga and breathe too. In fact, there's some cool work, just as a quick tip, that if you'd like to do both the benefits of improving nitric oxide in your um, 
bodies and sorry that should be NO not NO2 and also stimulate the vagus nerve as we've talked about being important there's a real simple thing to do and this is drawing from yogic practice um, but has now been also scientifically tested so two languages are now speaking the same uh, concepts is that humming will stimulate the vagus nerve and it also affects those turbinates we were looking at such that it seems to have the effect of upping the nitric oxide produced in the nasal cavities by about um, 15 percent, 10 to 15 percent. So alternatives if you don't want to do the yogic practice yet is that you can also get these uh, nasal breathing benefits it seems by building aerobic capacity or the capacity to deal with air in the body and that ways of doing that can be what's often referred to as 80-20 running or math tone running in other words you're building an aerobic base or similarly strength efforts that also blend high intensity effort with low slow strength work all seem to help build up this aerobic base to which is effectively the capacity of the body to deal with air or increase its capacity. We'll come on to that. Coming up here is that part three of why we breathe here is this notion of energy regeneration and action. And so the what of the breathing, this might be familiar to some of you, is that when we think about well what's breathing doing, it's the exchange of gases uh, in the body of O2 into CO2. We have happy wonderful O2 coming into our lungs and then being pumped through the blood. The process is magnificent of how that happens. And then sort of like when the blood's done with the oxygen, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, is spat out through our exhalation. True, but you might ask the next question of, well, okay, why do we do that, um, that gas exchange? And just a quick word on that gas exchange because it's awesome is that this is why we also have red blood cells. Is that red blood cells, well, or why we have blood. Blood is the transport mechanism for the body. I think that is so cool. And within that are these red blood cells, these things that look like um, lifesavers with the hole filled in. And um, what happens is, is that uh, this is where iron comes into red blood cells. So that's used as a part of the bonding agent almost to hold O2 as it's carried through the bloodstream and then to let it diffuse, it's just diffusion out of the bloodstream into cells that need it. And we're going to talk about why they need it. And that, that the, uh, what's finished with the cells when they finish with oxygen is not just CO2 but also water. And water is really important to our circulation and well-being. And that gets into the bloodstream. But CO2 is really important. Not, it's not a, just a waste product. It's important for buffering, for, our, for uh, managing our pH levels in our blood. And it comes out and is carried through the blood as bicarbonate. Uh, you know, bicarbonate of soda. We're going to come on to that and, and a little bit about why that is actually so cool and important in terms of why we practice uh, aerobic level exercises to help us uh, have more bicarbonate available in the blood. Why would we want that? What does that buffering mean? Well, it's, it's kind of cool. We'll talk about that. But the biggie, the biggie here about why we do all this um, breathing and bringing air into the body and why the whole uh, heart pumping mechanism of moving blood through the body is moving, what it's moving in the blood is really what the biggie is about blood moving through the body as opposed to blood moving itself. Blood is a transport mechanism. What's going on? Here's the big ta-da is that the big reason um, for oxygen, for air coming into the body, is to fuel cells. It is necessary for cells. Here's a little picture of a cell down here. And here's, you might have heard of mitochondria. They could be aliens that have parasitically bonded with us in our cells. That the story of this, is, you've got to talk to Richard Watson about this, of, of how mitochondria came to be in our cells is incredible because not all our cells have mitochondria. But as you can see, there's lots of stuff going on in a cell of which these little uh, hot dogs here of mitochondria are but one organelle in a cell that produces the energy. And well, how does it produce it? By um, being able to take in oxygen at some point, well it's later on, but anyway, oxygen is used in various processes in these cycles in the mitochondria. You might have heard of glycolysis, so there's, there's kind of three pathways of energy and they all cascade uh, down where glycolysis 
gets in and um, let me take take a look here gets into the cell it breaks down into another reaction that breaks down into another reaction that breaks down into another reaction all of these producing different levels and amounts of energy in the cell till we get to the ekron transport chain that needs oxygen that fundamental step especially requires oxygen in fact there are about six different ways uh, that are counted up that the body can produce energy only two of them are really what is called anaerobic or can work without um, oxygen and, bo and both of them are really so they can be super fast and incredible but they're really short and because of that because they, they the anaerobic process is not sustainable for life uh, it's kind of like short until you get back to an oxygenated level um, these other processes use oxygen all of them to get and you can see an example here from proteins carbs uh, fats all at some point come into the same cycle that requires oxygen again we can get into that maybe a bit more next time um, but suffice it to say oxygen is essential to this process and carbon dioxide uh, is also essential to this process of getting into the bloodstream uh, in order to make sure that homeostatic balance of what our blood pH levels are as we get active um, is maintained. So what else is happening? Okay, so we see this energy happening, but what is that energy doing in the cells? Well, the cells aren't just creating little bundles of energy. That energy in the cells, depending on what kind of cells they are, is being used to do everything from building all sorts of new tissue, uh, renewing hormones, renewing uh, different processes in the body as some are autophaged away um, or um, effectively pulled out of the body um, or recycled in the body. That is all happening because we're able to breathe and produce energy that lets the cells do what they're designed to do. An example is skeletal muscle on a couple levels that allows us to um, build new tissue. Uh, that's uh, anabolism as opposed to catabolism, which is to get rid of uh, older tissue that is no longer functioning or needed. And so that an anabolic catabolic process is fueled by all of these cells. We also see that in muscle simply in uh, terms of contracting a muscle. That is something that we see supported, essentially has to be supported by cells doing these things. So what do we got here is that we have in some these three ways in which breathing is so essential for us in terms of our survival because in the first case where we saw awareness and pattern building by inhaling uh, that phase to help us focus and remember and associate uh, things with the inhalation and build up those patterns you can see that is really important for survival is to be able to recognize something clearly and we know that that nasal trigger the smell the scent is a huge trigger to identifying rapidly what is around us and whether it's a threat that we need to avoid or kill. So the next one also in terms of being able to have these processes that let our body support problem solving and creativity to get into an open stage to see, well again in the yoga practice it is to, to see one's place in the universe um, or the universe itself or to have these incredibly profound experiences to the mundane everyday problem solving ones is also critical to our survival as we've seen over evolutionary periods of being able to build tools come up with new ways of being uh, technology effectively of our problem solving and finally it's essential not just critical it's essential it doesn't happen without this um, air is needed uh, to come in oxygen is needed to come in to support uh, every cellular process that requires and thrives on energy and uh, such as tissue rebuilding uh, but every part of our well-being requires that that energy um, and action to movement itself so those, those are the three things you can take home to your next uh, zoom cocktail party to say why do we breathe and see how many people come up with these three things here's a quick bonus uh, as we wrap up and that's on breath holding. We touched on this in the first part about uh, the breath hold and why that's a good thing is that it helps us like the weightlifting, if you will, of breathing is, is the breath hold 
And uh, this, <laughs> these pictures um, recognize that, that uh, video is from uh, Radiohead, an incredible um, video for no surprises. And what we can see here is that Tom York is a bit of a mouth breather, eh? Uh, so why, why is uh, breath holding great? Well, again, it's in this process of how O2 and CO2 is processed in the bloodstream and what happens again for those periods when we're working and we run out of uh, air or, or, or oxygen and we go into a, what's called a fermentation process effectively of using lactate um, to drive cell energy for a brief period. And the better we can have that bicarbonate management in our cells, the pH uh, maintaining a certain level. See, what happens, I guess, the quickest way to talk about this is that lactate um, builds up the acid level in the bloodstream, and that's not a happy thing. We start to have chemoreceptors going, this is not a good environment, and uh, wants us then to stop moving to conserve energy and not use as much oxygen effectively, the more that we can process breathing um, to handle that, to buffer that, uh, and by breath holding we effectively do that, we build up better tolerances, um, the more work we can do. Also one of the other side effects of breath holding in, in certain ways is that we're able to create more of these red blood cells this is the thing that happens at altitude training. I'd love to get into that with you, but perhaps at a, another time, because this is getting quite long already. There are, If you're interested in the breath holding part of this, there are two approaches that you can look at. Um, they're both hy hypercapnic um, or hypoxic rather training, which is hypoxic is the lack of oxygen. The difference between these two approaches is one is hypercapnic, which is the buildup of CO2 in the in the blood to tolerate that, and the other one is hypocapnic, which is uh, breathing really deeply and hard and pushing out the CO2 to have an oxygen buildup, and they have different um, effects. The reason I particularly like the um, hypercapnic approach is that that better simulates or lets me simulate or an athlete simulate um, altitude training and thus the improvement or enhancement of red blood cells um, in the body for more oxygen, so better training effects. Whereas the hypocapnic, which is also part of my practice, just speaking personally, um, helps with, uh, has been shown to help with immune response, and I'm really grateful for that. So finally here, just to take a look at this, is uh, when we have this, this little device here, this pulse ox that's actually facing the wrong way, it needs to be over the nail bed, uh, most often, is that that helps us see what our oxygen saturation levels are, and that is that quality of oxygen in the blood. And for the most part, unless something weird is going on, uh, like you are not able to get oxygen to your lungs, this is why folks who are worried about having COVID have been buying up pulse oximeters left, right, and center, is to see I might feel great, but what's my oxygen saturation level? Normally it's between 95 and 99. And if it's lower than that, and you're not uh, above sea level by a great ways, then that's a problem. Um, and so it's, it's worth getting checked out, unless you're doing it deliberately in one of these uh, breath holding practices. Uh, so another part about um, opportunities for training uh, is not just to simulate altitude training, but also to get used to training with more CO2, which is what I'm using here, which is a training mask that helps keep CO2 um, closer into you. It's sort of like breathing in a paper bag while you're working out, so that again, you're practicing dealing with more CO2 in the bloodstream to improve performance and buffering in that environment and push the body to produce more red blood cells for better oxygen management because the more red blood cells you have, the more oxygen and CO2 carrying in the body, the more work the body can do. So that's about it. Uh, so we've seen that we've got these three processes of awareness, problem solving, and uh, energy, and we can look at these as the phase of the breath, the pace of the breath, and the depth uh, of the breath to draw in these attributes. We've looked before at how we can simulate this breathing by these five heuristics of nose, low, slow, light, and hold. And my 
goodness, that was a biggie. So I'd be keen to understand what your takeaways are and any questions you have. Thank you very much. This is MC Schrafel, and talk to you again soon.